Welcome to Shareholders of a Better World, brought to you by TBLI Group. At TBLI Group, we have an established reputation as an organization dedicated to building the ecosystem of global sustainability and impact investing. We're doing this through educating, advising, and facilitating transactions in global sustainability and impact business, as well as capital solutions for private companies, family offices, and fund groups. For nearly 25 years, TBLI Group has created a vertically integrated ecosystem of education to action through TBLI conferences and TBLI consulting. More about our company can be found at tbligroup.com. This webinar is brought to you by TBLI Foundation, which hosts educational learning experiences dedicated to a better planet. Through the foundation, we build sustainable communities by sharing the people and the experiences making a difference to so many of our lives around the world. Our weekly podcasts bring impact thought leaders that are doing and not only chatting. Now, let me introduce my guest today. Good afternoon from our studio in Amsterdam. Uh, before I introduce our special guest today, just some housekeeping instructions for those of you who've never joined uh, our, our platform before. So if you need to uh, ask a question or make a comment, just type it in the lower right-hand corner. If you need to, <clears throat> if you find anything brilliant or funny or you want to clap, there are three emojis at the bottom. Uh, if you have something really compelling and you want to grab the mic and join the podium, just press on the microphone next to your name. Um, and if you want to send a private message to anyone, just move your mouse over their name and a window will pop up. You can send that. So our guest today is um, uh, a dear friend, uh, Martin Rappaport, who, I, I, you know, sometimes we take on a challenging uh, issue and Martin wanted to create conflict diamond starting in Sierra Leone, you know, not exactly the most kosher place to get things done on governance side. And he was one of the, the founders of the Kimberley process uh, and actually participated in the, uh, in the first Kimberley meeting in 2000 and has worked tirelessly um, to, to basically bring some clarity, transparency, and also some, um, some menschkeit to the diamond industry. So I'm, I'm going to let Martin give you some more background about him, and I'll, we'll run a, a short uh, presentation that he'll do. So Martin, if you can unmute your mic. Uh, Here I am. I'm all set, ready to roll. Okay. So why don't you put up the slides? I don't know where your slides are, but if you can put the slides up there, we'll start with that. Um, thank you very much. It's great to be here uh, and to be with you. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, highlighting a lot of issues that are in the diamond industry, but they actually communicate much more than just diamonds. So I don't know, are you uh, putting up the slides yet or we're waiting for that? I can't hear you, but I'm sure you're doing something good there. Okay, this is great because uh, well, while while Robert's trying to figure you know figuring out how to put up the uh, PowerPoint presentation, uh, I'll just cover a few of the beginning of the slides. Um, the Rappaport Group, just some background. You know, we're value-based business, uh, ethical, transparent, competitive, efficient markets. So we very much work strongly on the idea of number one is ethical business, which is not so easy in the diamond business all the time. But transparency and competition coming together creates fair market value. We were established in 1978. We have over 20,000 clients in 121 countries, 230 employees, nine offices, and we're fundamentally in the added value services business. It's not working. Um, it's not working? Okay. So no, hang, maybe, on, hang on, hang on. I'll, I'll get I'm not it. sure you'll get it. Now, we, what we do – okay. We oh, we go. Okay. So next slide, and then next slide. So I was just saying we were in the added value business. So we don't maintain inventories, but we are the primary source of diamond price information for the diamond industry. We do research, analysis, magazine, diamonds.net is someplace where we also have a very strong online presence. We run a RapNet, which is the largest diamond trading network in the world. It lists daily uh, 1.7 million diamonds of the value of 8.4 billion, not million, but billion dollars. So we're pretty strong in terms of the diamond industry being able to provide uh, transparency into prices and people, et cetera. 
and we run with the largest recycler of diamonds in the world. We recycle about 450,000 carats of diamonds every year. We also do estate jewelry, and then we're involved in quality control services and source certification. Okay, so much for me, and next slide, please. All right, so what are we going to talk about today? What's happening here? The first thing is going to talk about blood diamonds, but not necessarily in the way you think about it, but blood diamonds, the concept of diamonds that are highly problematic in the sense that they're involved in physical torture. So we're not some theoretical conflict diamond discussion. Diamonds involved in torture. We're talking about the role of government. What are governments doing about this? We're going to talk about sanctions, and we will talk about the Russian sanctions, and then we'll talk about the role of the diamond trade and how the diamond trade is reacting to all of this and how it can do and what it should do in terms of moving itself further. Next slide, please. So first of all, we should understand the problem of commodities. Commodities, when they are in countries which are failed states or near failed states or corrupt governments, are actually a resource curse. And it's a real serious problem. I was in Sierra Leone during the war. I met with the head of the security people there. And he said, listen, you know, if a woman is beautiful and she's raped, if, if someone is a smart guy and he's killed because of it, this is not a blessing. So the diamonds in Sierra Leone, for example, were a resource curse. Um, and they could be a resource blessing like you might think, okay. But let's think about this idea of commodities, not just diamonds. Would we, would Russia have invaded Ukraine if it didn't have oil financing and money? Um, what happens with coltan, which is used for all these uh, iPhones and stuff? As a matter of fact, you can see a TED talk with me about coltan, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. And, you know, on one hand, we want to get coltan. We want to get certain minerals from the Congo, which is involved in a lot of human rights abuses. But, you know, we have a problem because we need those minerals to do um, environmentally efficient electricity or environmentally efficient uh, items. Even wheat, a commodity, which is a power. Think of commodities as power things. Uh, right now with the war uh, with Ukraine and Russia, I think wheat prices are up 50%. And then you've got gold and you've got diamonds. So when you're talking about a commodity, you're talking about a source of power. And it's not just about the money that the commodity can buy. Imagine that you are a very poor person in Sierra Leone. Your biggest concern is what are you going to eat tonight? What are you going to feed your children tonight? And are you going to have enough health? Can your wife sick? So it's about control. The resource provides survival for people. Okay? And, and don't make a mistake about it. All you people listening to this discussion I'm having today, if you were all in a room, all of us together in one room, and I threw out $10 million worth of diamonds on the floor, and I shut the lights, I'm not so sure everybody would be so civilized, okay? And you're dealing in an environment where you have people who don't have what to eat that night, and you've got diamonds that are alluvial, and they're available within one meter of the ground, of the surface of the ground. So when you have wealth, when you have minerals, when you have stuff like this, if you don't manage them correct, they are going to create problems, and they will create wars. Commodities become weapons. And you're talking about weapons that are used to take things from people. And you'll see when we talk about Sion. And you're also entering a new world today of economic warfare. Make no mistake about it. You may be talking about a situation where tanks are firing shots and, and, and there's rockets flying around and missiles in, in the Ukraine. And that's on the surface. But underneath this surface is economic warfare between the Western world and Russia. And I don't know where China is going to fall into this game and how China is looking at the world, but we are entering a period of economic warfare. Be aware of that as this sits in the background of this discussion. Next slide. So what happened in Sierra Leone? Well, you had a situation where you had an ongoing war. 500,000 people dead out of a population of 2.5 million. Maybe it was 3 million because that's what was left in 2000. 1 million people displaced. 27,000 amputees. I was in the amputee camp in 2000. Horrifying, shocking, mind-blowing. And you're talking about they had an infant mortality rate, a child mortality rate, that means under five, of 33%. And even in 2000, when the war was coming to an end, 11% of children died before the age of five. What wouldn't you do to keep your kid alive? That's the environment that was happening in Sierra Leone. So what happened? The government was corrupt. 
there was a rebel movement that was started, but the rebel movement, let me just get rid of this, sorry about that. The rebel movement was taken over by uh, Fodisanko and Fodisanko hooked up with Liberia and Liberia came in and said, oh, let me grab those diamonds. They enslaved people. Diamonds fueled the war. No diamonds, no war. So when I talk about a resource curse, I'm talking about warfare. People taking things from other people, taking the diamonds. But it wasn't just the diamonds. They enslaved the people. Once again, you're looking at economic warfare as a background, but actually what went on over here was no diamonds, no war. So when you're talking about, and you know, you think, oh, diamonds, but what about oil? Would there be what we see going on today in the world politic if oil wasn't so necessary? And, you know, it's really tough how these commodities work things out. I mean, you're in a situation today where the West is actually fighting both sides of the war. They're funding Russia by buying the oil. And they're funding the Ukraine with, with, uh, with efforts to stop the war. So commodities play a huge role in what's happening. And sometimes we don't quite understand the political and military implications. Next slide. So what happened? You have this situation where people are getting killed. We had to do something. I mean, the, the government of South Africa, um, from Zila, who was then the minister of mines, later became the vice president, they said, we got to do something because all diamonds are going to have a bad name. And South Africa was a primary diamond manufacturer. They still are and was an important part of their economy. And so they got together and they said, we got to do something. And they brought the trade and NGOs together. Although the trade and NGOs were just kind of people hanging around to give legitimacy. But it was important. I spent about four years of my life on this process. And we stopped the war. What happened was that, first of all, the governments came in. And they created an environment, this process, which had NGOs and had trade as observers without voting rights. So we couldn't control anything. We had influence. Uh, but all the decisions had to meet 100%. So when you have these international organizations, I'm talking about the Kimberley process. Tomorrow could be something else. When you have these international organizations that need 100% agreement on something, they become very dangerous. We did stop the war because we controlled the movement of rough diamonds anywhere in the world. Before that time, diamonds could just move across borders without any questions. I mean, essentially, you had a situation where Liberia was digging up these diamonds, enslaving people, and then selling the diamonds through Switzerland to diamond manufacturing, getting the cash, and using that cash to buy more weapons and more, and just creating more, more problems. And this stopped it because you couldn't export the diamonds anymore to Switzerland or Belgium or Israel or India or anywhere else. So we stopped the war, which was good. People were getting killed, right? But things that you start and you deal with international organizations and you're trying to do good things, you know, how should I say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. It was good. We stopped the war, but no good deed goes unpunished. So what happened? They did this thing with the uh, Kimberley process. They certified diamonds, and but they defined it very narrowly. They said, we are calling conflict diamonds a name game. Conflict diamonds are diamonds that fund rebel movements against governments like what you had in Sierra Leone with the RUF. So they made a very narrow definition, but it didn't include human rights violations. So they said, we are going to have a system that certifies the international movement of diamonds. We will stop diamonds that are involved in rebel movements against governments. But other diamonds, we're going to certify them as okay. So, for example, with this definition, are diamonds coming out of Russia today conflict diamonds? No. Are diamonds involved in human rights abuses in uh, Zimbabwe today? No. So it was a narrow definition. Now, what happened was the industry seized upon this definition and told everybody, as long as you have a Kimberley process certificate, you're fine. The diamonds are kosher. Everything's good. But those diamonds could be involved in human rights abuses. Go to the next slide, please. So what happened? I'm defining blood diamonds as diamonds that are directly involved in torture and slavery. In merengue fields, in... Uh, in Zimbabwe, a couple of years ago, they actually had helicopter gunships shooting the diggers to clear areas. 
But they torture people. Straight and simple. They sick dogs on people. Occasionally they kill people. They beat people up. They take people that are in the mining area and they put them in cages. There are actual human rights abuses in Merengue today documented. We just published something in March about this. So what happens? You got the Minister of Mines, which is a corrupt individual or vice president or the president of the country, of Zimbabwe. And they torture people or they have people torturing people. And then what happens to those diamonds? Those diamonds get Kimberly Process certificates. They're legitimized. They're exported. After they're exported, they're legitimate. So uh, not only do we have a situation where they're certifying these diamonds involved in human rights abuses as kosher and good, okay? But then they become legitimate. So merengue over 2016, 2020, and we have the data from the Kimberly process even, they certified $440 million of diamonds, even more, but we estimate $440 million of blood diamonds. Certified kosher. And what does that mean when the Kimberley process certifies something? So this, this organization, this effort that was made to stop a war is then used to legitimize human rights abuses. Next page. So the KP becomes a washing machine for dirty diamonds and dirty money. Because once that minister or whoever it is gets the bribe, sends the diamonds out of the country, not only are the diamonds legitimate, into the that means you have these blood diamonds coming into the legitimate distribution system, but the money that gets paid for those diamonds is legitimate. So now the guy can smile. He says, Oh, it's wonderful. I love the Kimberly process. It gives me the chance to get all this money. So the KP is the washing machine for dirty diamonds and dirty money, even though it was originally created to do good things. So it's actually the world's greatest government supported greenwashing operation. That's what the Kimberly process is. And I'm not sorry that we did it because we saved lives in Sierra Leone, but you gotta be very careful when you're working with these governments. So when it comes to human rights, governments cannot, should not be trusted, particularly governments that are in these groupings, like the United Nations groupings, Kimberly process groupings. You get a bunch of governments together and human rights goes right out the window. Okay, so just be aware of that. It's a lesson from what happened here. We do things with the best of intentions. <clears throat> and then if we don't watch it, they become manipulated and they become used. And there are some very bad governments out there, like the Zimbabwe, C.A.R. OK, next slide. So what happened here with the story? Let's think about this. So we got the situation which we saw in Africa. 500,000 people get killed. Governments come in and create a process. The process gets abused. Okay, it's an issue. So we have a problem of human rights abuses. We have a problem of blood diamonds in the diamond industry. And we have a problem of a government-authorized program legitimizing the distribution of these blood diamonds into the normal diamond distribution. Okay, big problem. But now let's take the more contemporary look. So we have this idea of terminology and name games. Like I told you, conflict diamonds? Oh, I have non-conflict diamonds for you. What are those non-conflict diamonds? Is there human rights abuses involved in those non-conflict diamonds? What do you think? Yes, you can take a human right, you can take a diamond involved in torture, torture and murder and anything else. And it's a, it's a non-conflict diamond. So they use terminology to screw around. Let's take a look at the U.S. The U.S. sanctions. And I love the United States. It's definitely doing a lot of good things. As a matter of fact, they're sanctioning diamonds from Zimbabwe, uh, but no one pays attention. But in any case, look at this Russian origin. So the United States comes out a third of March. We are sanctioning our Rosa, which is a good idea because the Rosa is getting money and they're using the money to fuel the war against, uh, you know, to fuel war, um, to fuel the war. And they make a big announcement. No more Russian origin diamonds. So a normal human being would say, oh, that's great. They're stopping the sales that, uh, that he said, he does not even do this, okay. They're stopping the sale of Russian diamonds. Isn't that great? But you know, that's not what's happening here. They use a technical term, like, like conflict diamond was a term that, doesn't deal with human rights abuses, or everybody would think it does. And they use origin. But origin in the in the customs land 
has a very strange phrase. It doesn't mean the source. So what it means is that the U.S. sanctions are meaningless because if I buy a Russian rough diamond today, I'm not allowed to. I won't. But someone in India, maybe someone in Belgium, buys the diamond from directly with the, their government. Doesn't say you're not allowed to buy diamonds from Mount Rosa. Buys the diamond, but cuts it in India. Cuts it outside of Russia. The definition of the origin of the diamond then becomes India or Belgium or wherever it's cut. No problem. So it's not a Russian origin diamond anymore. So what's going on? They played a name game. So I can be an Indian manufacturer. I can buy all the diamonds I want from Russia. I simply, that's not just, I cut them in India. Like, by the way, 93% of the world's diamonds are cut in India anyhow. And then I go and I sell it to the United States of America. No problem. I haven't violated any sanctions. Nothing bad is happening. Okay. So what you get is you get this government misdirection, miscommunication, name games, or whatever have you. And everybody thinks one thing, and the reality is something else. And this is a fundamental problem when you're dealing with greenwashing. And you're not talking about little one company greenwashing something. You're talking about governments dealing with one-third of the world's diamonds, okay, billions of dollars of diamonds. So we have to understand that if we're going to take social responsibility seriously and anything, it could be coltan, it could be you name it, whatever commodity, oil, whatever you name the commodity, we should not sit here like a bunch of suckers and believe all the things that we're hearing about from governments. Every government has their priorities, has their reasons, has their compromises. I'm not saying governments are evil. But it's not the job of governments to stop human rights abuses. They say it is, but they don't do it. Just take that as an important lesson that we've learned from the diamond industry, both in the year 2002 or 2004 when the Kimberley process was implemented and in 2022 when we're dealing with Russian sanctions right now. So much for governments. Next slide, please. So what happened here? You know, I see I actually have too few slides. Usually I have so many slides, but I'll have lots of time for discussion and stuff. here. So what happens here? So the trade's sitting here. They're trying to sell diamonds. And uh, for the longest time, I'm talking maybe 15, 20 years, maybe 15 years, they're saying, you know, it's a conflict-free diamond, conflict-free diamond. Okay, so helicopter gunships are shooting people in... Uh, in Merengue, uh, Zimbabwe, yeah, it's a non-conflict diamond. Don't ask me questions. So the trade was actually participating in this greenwashing operation for many years because they get away with it. And I don't know how aware consumers were in terms of the supply chain issues. You know, an interesting story here about uh, Nike. And I think it was at around 1996 remember the exact date, and Nike was found to be using child labor in uh, Vietnam. And it was a big scandal, and their share price went down 50%, and their sales went down. And then that sort of woke people up to this idea, hey, you know, we got to be careful about what we're buying here because we may be supporting child labor. And then you had those situations, I think it was in, uh, what's the next, Pakistan or someplace near India, and like a, a building fell down and killed 80 people or 100 people in a factory. What's been happening over the last decade is that the awareness of social responsibility has been increasing along with the temperature in the world. Because as they say, environmental, what do I care about? Environmental, environmental, environmental. But now, not only do we have a new generation of consumers emerging in the West, who are more attuned, but they're saying, hey, <laughs> you're an old guy. You don't care about global warming, but us, we're feeling it. And so the entire awareness of social responsibility of supply chain, essentially, where's your money going, baby, has become very much more real. And people want to buy products that are good. And you know something, you buy sneakers, eh, you bounce, you break on the court, it's better, it's worse. You give someone an engagement ring. 
and you show that an engagement ring has made the world a better place. The emotional impact of that gift is so much more powerful. Or God forbid you give someone an engagement ring that came from slavery or came from torture or something. So the world of jewelry is maybe even more sensitized to the concept of social responsibility than other products. But it's true of everything today. Everything that people buy. Maybe not yet gasoline in the, in the gas station, but pretty much every, and certainly in the fashion industry, you're seeing a lot of recycling. You're seeing the entire movement of society becoming much more sensitized to social responsibility. Not everywhere. I'm not sure that Chinese consumers really care that much about whether or not this diamond comes from a bad place or not. They're not necessarily orientated to it, but it's changing. The leading feelings and concept of people in the world are all now much more attuned to the need to have a decent supply chain. So supply chain, supply chain, supply chain, it never used to be a part of the consumer terminology has today become important. So what happens? The diamond trade sits back. They play the greenwashing game with the Kimberly prices as long as they can. And then all of a sudden consumers, and not just consumers, let's assume you're a big brand. You're Cartier. You're Van Cleef. You're Tiffany. Your brand value is huge. Remember the story I just told you about Nike? You're sitting on the board of directors of Tiffany or Cartier. Your number one job is to make sure that your brand doesn't get damaged. That's the number one thing you worry about. Whether you make more money or not, you don't want to be in a situation where your brand gets hurt. And something like a blood diamond could really hurt your brand. So everybody in the industry, not everybody, but the leaders of the industry, the brands of the industry, and we all know that brand value is critical, not just in jewelry, but in everything, but certainly in jewelry. They say, hold on a minute, I don't want to have any problems over here. Where's your supply chain? And so this awareness of supply chain grows. The industry recognizes they can no longer rely upon the lies of the Kimberly process. And they say, we got to create another organization. We can't rely on government, so we're going to create an organization. And they go create an organization called the Responsible Jewelry Council. They sign up around 1,400 members so far. They set standards based on OECD standards. And they require auditing. Relatively good order. I mean, we're members, so, you know, every three years they get ordered. It's not perfect, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. And they make the claim and they make the effort to say, we recognize the world is not perfect, but we're constantly improving. They join ICEAL, which is a critical, which, which promotes credible sustainability standards. And so the Responsible Jewelry Council becomes a trade organization with members that 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 subscribes to a given list of standards some good some not so good it's kind of not perfect yet even if you talk about oecd standards okay i comply with them but the oecd standards are voluntary so. but it's in the move in the right direction so we see what happens when governments screw up on human rights companies move in they create some kind of organization like the rjc but the rjc isn't perfect because you know they're they still have their hand in all of these other diamonds and they have their members that are making a lot of money on these diamonds from Zimbabwe. So they support the Kimberly process, even though the Kimberly process is certifying blood diamonds. And that's where I'm fighting right now. You say, what is Martin Rapport doing these days about social responsibility? I'm going to war against this Kimberly process, although I <laughs> spent four years of my life creating it. But I don't think the RJC should say that those diamonds are okay. So they're turning a blind eye to money laundering and greenwashing, while at the same time promoting standards. So they're doing good things, but they're not perfect. And not only are they not perfect, but trade organizations tend to be, how should I describe it? You know, okay, but they're doing good things. You got to encourage the good, but I would not rely on them. They're sort of like half kosher, but they're good. They're doing good things. So you know, where do you deal with this? How do you deal with an organization that's doing good things but isn't really, you know, up to your standard? And I'm going to bring that point to you very soon. So in any case, um, we have a situation where there's more money loaning and greenwashing in the industry. 
it's not being stopped by the big who has but with the big who has they're doing the same when i buy diamonds i'm more careful but my organization allows some of this not such kosher stuff to happen. So trade organizations are better than governments. At least they're not actively doing stuff. Well, a little bit better. But they definitely are trying to reach for a higher target of social responsibility than governments can do it. And governments were going to say, well, you know, we have sovereignty issues. And if you're going to stop us from one country is going to stop another country for doing diamonds because of all kinds of human rights stuff. We cannot put human rights into the government situation. As a matter of fact, if you look at the World Trade Organization, which is another not one of my favorite places, um, they do not have an ability to allow countries to say we're not dealing with countries because of human rights abuses has to be some kind of a cooked up to some kind of a national security thing. Um, so in any case, governments know, bad, evil even, um, companies, they're trying to, they're on the, the way to try to do things. Next slide, please. So I go out there and I write, what should we do about blood diamonds? I take, I send people into the merengue fields to take photographs. I get testimonies. And I shove this into the face of the diamond industry. I'm talking about what we put out on March 3rd or 4th. This is even before we actually published this, just before this whole Russian invasion things happened. So we're campaigning to have the trade answer the question, what should we do about the diamonds? This is the cover of this thing. And if you want more information, you should go to sr.rabbitport.com, social responsibly SR. But there's a campaign within the industry. So activists within an industry can influence trade organizations. I don't care if you're talking about diamonds, coltan, uh, gold, um, oil, okay? It's this, I'm trying to give you the bigger picture of how the world really works and what we can really do as activists within an industry. Next slide. So the RJC doesn't do anything about blood diamonds. It fails to enforce that. Now, here's the thing. You know, we, we look at what happened now. And sometimes, you know, you have these concepts, ideas, but you don't know what's going to really happen until the thing hits the fan. Russia attacking Ukraine is an example of something hitting the fan. It tests what is going on here with these organizations. How effective are they when it comes to social responsibility? So what happens? Russia's Al Rosa is doing a diamond mine, very close to the government, 33% owned by the Russian government, and they're on the UN sanctions list. An American is not allowed to deal with them, and I hear that UK, EU has been demurring. Okay, I guess they're afraid because they don't have enough oil. But UK today, I think it was or yesterday, put them on the sanctions list. So a minute here. You got an organization that says, we are working to create standards for a legitimate diamond industry and jewelry industry and everything, not just diamonds. Now you get an organization called Al Rosa, which is a big organization, does 30% of the world's up diamonds. And they remain members. They remain members. They're not kicked out. Holy crap, they're not kicked out. You can't deal with them. I would go to jail if I dealt with Al Rosa. But they're a member of this wonderful organization that's telling everybody, we are the leaders, we are a trade organization, and we are in charge of making sure there's standards and there's ethics. So that's where, you know, everything. How should I say the rubber meets the road over here? Okay. And what happens? They don't kick them out. They have problems, legitimately. Supposedly there's a meeting tomorrow. But what happens? The executive director of Responsible Jewelry resigns. Richmond, which has the big brands, Cartier, Van Cleef, more, they resign. They say, I want nothing to do with this responsible jewelry council, which is really, I am telling you, the best organization for making the world a better place in the jewelry industry. They step away from it. They say, I'm sorry. We can't be a member of an organization that has members that we're not allowed to deal with in the support war of Russia against Ukraine. A split. Like the splitting of the seas, you know, Passover is in two weeks, right? Splitting of the seas here. And so now, because of this Russian invasion, we're getting to reality, forcing these organizations to make decisions. And this is great because now they have to really stand up. So when Richemont walks away from the Responsible Jewelry Council, 
the board of directors and they resigned they were on the board the board of directors says holy crap we we got we got to now sanction russia we can't sit here and do it so you need to understand the concept of how we can do social responsibility in the trade number one standards there has to be standards what does it mean that you're socially responsible number two auditing you say you do something, but you got to know that you do what you say. Say what you do, do what you say, and get audited. And number three, which has been the failure of the RJC so far, is that you have to execute. You have to um, enforce your standards. So if someone violates your standard, boom, out you go. Then you can create a group of people who deal with each other in an industry, be it diamonds or any other in this jewelry or you name the industry, because I want to talk beyond simply my experiences with diamonds here so we can learn a more general rule. Any trade organization, any effort to do social responsibility anywhere in any industry, forget about the governments, they're not going to protect the human rights. They'll promote it, but they're not going to protect it. The trade can protect it, but only if they have standards, if they have auditing and if they have um you know if they if they expire they kick people out okay they have execution okay now so what happened here the rjc has standards the rjc has auditing but it did not have the ability to execute on that and now because of the russian invasion of the ukraine it got pushed into their face top brands left them and now they're being forced to start to execute and they're being forced to start to enforce. I mean, the word execute, I mean, enforce, enforce your standards, baby. Now, if you do that, you end up with a group of people, not everyone, maybe the Chinese guys aren't in there, or maybe certainly the Zimbabwean guys aren't in there. Um, and you're cool. You're able to do a lot of good things. Okay. That's the solution. That's where we're going with these little bubbles or subsets of companies that band together to raise the flag of social responsibility to trade with each other. And now we get to a situation where some U.S. US retailers say, listen, I know you played that stupid game with the phrase, uh, what was it? It wasn't source. What was the phrase we used? Um, uh, what's the origin. I know you played the origin game. But I don't care about that. If you buy rough diamonds from Russia, you can cut them in India. You can cut them in Honolulu. I don't care. I'm not buying them. I'm not buying them. I have the right to decide what I want to buy. I have the responsibility to decide where I buy. So even though the United States government schmadrayed and screwed around and said, well, origin, da, 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 I as a company am saying, I no longer want to buy those diamonds. Don't supply them to me. So what are we learning here? We're learning that money talks. When you want to really affect change, laws are good. Laws are important. We stop the war. You know. But if you really want to affect social responsibility, put your money where your mouth is. Because what makes the world go round in the end is money. Straight and simple. Money, money, money. Next slide. So what's going to happen here? First of all, the diamond industry is on the slippery slope of legitimacy. We start doing things, and then all of a sudden we realize there's got to be more social responsibility, and the Kimberley process comes in, and RJC comes in, and then we have the issue about Russia, and then all this, everybody knows that they have to start becoming more legitimate. Very good. Now, source certification is the way forward. That's what's going to happen. It's like kosher certification. So I'm saying to you, you know, you a watch. I don't know anybody has any watches that don't have the name of some brand on them. I don't perceive there to be diamonds that we won't know where they come from. It costs more money. Now, there will be some diamonds we don't know where they come from. And maybe there'll be diamonds that come from an evil place. And maybe they'll be sold somewhere else. Maybe China doesn't care. But consumers who care about this are going to want to know where the diamonds come from or where the jewelry comes from, where the gold comes from, whatever have you, where the clothing comes from, where the undershirts come from. So markets will be bifurcated between socially responsible, that's one group, unknown, I don't know where this came from, and evil stuff. 
Just give me a big diamond. I don't care if it's a blood diamond. Some people might say somewhere. So now you're thinking about the bifurcation of markets, not bifur trifurcation, separation of markets. Socially responsible trade organizations are going to emerge that are going to establish standards, require auditing, and enforce standards through expulsion. You can't be a member of the group. Now, this doesn't violate any laws because I'm telling you, you want to join my country club, please. You got to wear pants. By the way, talking about pants, the problem with the responsible jewelry council is if you're, you're climbing trees and you're telling the world, we are guaranteeing the, uh, the ethics of this thing, people who climb trees should wear pants. That's what I think. Okay? Wear pants because everybody's going to be looking at you. So if you stick your neck out like that's why I say you're on the slippery slope because you're yelling and screaming every I am kosher, I am legitimate. You better buddy well be legitimate because people will look at you. Next slide. Now here's the trick. There's going to be higher prices for socially responsible diamonds. Money talks. So a consumer says, I'm willing to pay more if I know where the diamond comes from. The Beers did some research and they claim maybe 10 to 15%. I'm not so sure how it is but you could be getting 10% more retail for socially responsible diamonds, socially responsible jewelry, socially responsible products, socially responsible footballs, whatever the hell it is. And you can see what's been going on in fair trade, which is a very high level of social responsibility. So social responsibility is an added value proposition. I take a rough diamond. I cut it. I make it more shiny than the next guy. My diamond's worth more than the next guy because it's shinier. I take a diamond, I monitor it, I know what mine it came from, I know who cut the diamond, I make sure that the factory has fire extinguishers and ventilation so no one's choking a diamond dust. That diamond is worth more because I monitored it. This concept of having a um, supply chain monitoring adds value to products. And I can also sell the brands, I can also do other things. So what I'm saying to you, strange enough, that if you have to pay to be good. You got, it's got to pay to be good. You want to be good? You got to make more money. It costs you more, but it, the, the, it has to be. Now, what happens here? What's fair? Society will get the exact level of social responsibility consumers are willing to pay for no more and no less. This is an economic added value story that I'm talking about here. Governments can talk this and that, anti-money laundering, moving in and out of I don't know where, Dubai or Africa or who knows where, okay? But in the bottom line is if you want social responsibility, you should be treating it like an added value economic thing and you should market it. That's the true game of if you want to incorporate social responsibility change. This is what I've learned in the last 23 years playing and dealing with this. Next slide. So what are our lessons here? Don't trust governments when it comes to human rights, especially international groups. Don't buy their bullshit, to be clear. You can listen to them. You can use them. Don't rely on them. Social responsibility is an economic proposition. Consumers decide what they want and how much they're willing to pay for it. If they don't want social responsibility, good luck trying to sell it to them. Now, it doesn't mean we can't market it to them. Could doesn't mean we can't use all of the great marketing skills in the world to make people excited about social responsibility. And I am predicting social responsibility competition. My diamond is nicer than your diamond because I know where it came from. It came from a place in Africa where they actually help people. They make the world a better place. They give good opportunities to people. The factory is clean and neat. Good things are done with this diamond. And it has to be sustainable. If you're just going to do charity, and I worked very hard to create the first digger cooperatives in Sierra Leone after the war, but they weren't sustainable. So people went and they worked, but after two years they had to be let go. So we need to create sustainable economic propositions regarding added value of social responsibility. I'll say that again. Sustainable economic propositions regarding added value that comes from social responsibility. We do that and we win. And that's the key. Charity is that eh, nice, but no, it's not going to manage to do it. Next slide. So what's the fundamental concept here? What's sitting behind all of this? 
you're responsible for what you buy, whether you're a consumer, whether you're a dealer, because, you know, there's the positive side. I can make money by being socially responsible and adding value. But there's also the ethical concept. If you want to be a decent person, you give money to somebody who is going to be creating, uh, who's killing people. That's no good. You need to ask the question, not just where are your diamonds coming from? Where's your money going? Having money, and I watched diggers that didn't know what they were going to feed their children that night. You don't have no idea how blessed we are living in the West or being whatever it is. I mean, you have no idea. There are people that literally are on the, on the, on the edge of existence. And so where's your money going? This is the future. This is when we talk social responsibility. What are we, are you responsible? So you say, I don't know. I just bought a diamond. I don't know. I just bought a t-shirt. I don't know. I just bought something. I don't know. We have to see over the horizon. What is going on with supply chains? And I am predicting that the certification, and that's one of the businesses we're going into, the certification of supply chains. That is what we're going to be seeing. You have the blockchain, you have this, you have that. You have all kinds of things happening. But the certification, using any kind of technology of supply chains, that's the future, in my view, of social responsibility in the 21st century, especially in our decade here. Um, I'm Martin at Rappaport.com. You can send me an email. I got five or six people that are reading those emails. You can check out, if you really want to know more about social responsibility in the jewelry industry, we have an amazing website. We're just about to launch sr.rabbitport.com. It'll tell you everything about sanctions. It'll tell you everything about uh, blood diamonds. It'll give that blood diamond article, et cetera. So we are actually uh, investing money without getting much return. I don't expect returns, but we're putting efforts into creating an infrastructure, into creating a sustainable environment uh, for social responsibility in the jewelry industry. So back to you, Robert. <laughs> Thank you, Martin, very much for that. Um, I just want to give you a, a, a little advice. I think you need to be a little bit less timid, a little bit more shy, and become a little bit more outspoken. You know. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. That's and uh, I just want to uh, paraphrase about money talk. I, I love the the quote by Dylan. He says, "Money doesn't talk; it's wears." So uh, I just uh, that. But I, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions before I open it up to the audience. I remember watching a, um, a BBC documentary about your initiative years ago, and there was a hip hop uh, guy who went with you to, I think it was Sierra Leone. And I remember you saying something really important to the guy. He said, you know, we're going to go in the jungle. And if we're successful, there's no ribbon cutting ceremony to, you know, to sing your praises. And that hip hop guy supposedly withdrew from the initiative. Is that true? Well, yeah, I think that, look, these are very hard initiatives and people come and they look at it um, and no one realizes how difficult it is. So, you know, that's okay. Um, and I encourage people to come and look. We took a, a tour. I actually got a group of people to come to Sierra Leone. My son, as he was very helpful in organizing that. And we took them up to the where they found the peace diamond. We, we found the peace diamond. The government came to me and said, we have a diamond here. The diggers gave the diamond to the government. If you can tell the audience what is the peace diamond. Some okay. of what, what happened was some of the poorest people in the world from the village of Coriardu in Sierra Leone found a 709 carat diamond. So this is about this big. Okay. There's actually pictures of it. If you type in peacediamond.com. And instead of selling it to the local Lebanese dealers who smuggled it out of the country for $500,000, they gave it to the government. And the government didn't just put it in his pocket, the president. He had decided, I'm going to do something straight with this. And they got in touch with my son, Ezzy, and they got in touch with me. And I said, you know what? If you take the money from that diamond and you put it into the village where they found it, because it's kind of amazing that the... The diggers just trusted the government there. I will sell it for free. I won't charge any commission. I'll auction it off. I'll spend time taking the diamond around the world, and I will sell it. And, in fact, I did do an auction, and I sold it for $6.5 million to Lori Graff, Graff Jewelers, who now cut it. 
But the government did what they were supposed to do when they moved about a million and a half dollars, two million almost, to the village. They got a road. You're talking about a place, and if you look at the thing, the guy sitting under leaves when, they, when we were first talking to them, they got clean water. Clean water. Number one thing that stops infant mortality. They got electricity. I was there the first time we turned electricity on in the village. They got a road. They got a, a like a medical place where people can give birth. You know, they got a school, a school for the kids. Okay, and so other people seeing this say, "Wow, you know, if you give your diamonds to the government instead of smuggling it out, so the government made money here, no question about it. The price was much higher. So that was the peace diamond story." And there's a village, and we're working now to get the show everybody what actually happened in it. So this idea that you can come in and affect change is real, but it's a long haul, baby. <laughs> okay. And so you know, so someone that comes along, I think his name was Chris Ayer, and um, you know, it's not for everybody. It really isn't. Um, you know, uh, it's 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 tough. It's the other stuff. But the truth of the matter is that you can have greater impact in places like that. And I should point out the Bears has something called Gem Fair there now, where they're actually tracing the diamonds, the source from the artisanal diggers. They're auctioning the diamonds. So we are seeing change in the very most difficult places on earth uh, to legitimize the product from these artisanal diggers. So. Yeah, it's but it's a long. I mean, I've, I've been working in Sierra Leone for twenty years as they're doing I, the work. Twenty. I had, years. Another, I had another question. I want to ask if that this is true. When you started um, the Rappaport company and was bringing transparency to the diamond industry, I heard that you had to wear a bulletproof vest because people were not too happy about that. Is well, yeah. What, what, what happened was diamond prices were going up, so everybody was using the Rappaport price list and like the benchmark price. And then when diamonds markets crashed in 1980, and they really did crash, a, a one carat default went from sixty-six thousand dollars a carat to twelve. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kept publishing prices. They threw me out of the Diamond Dealers Club and all that stuff. I came back in with a court order, but I did get I did get uh, threats against my life. Uh, so for about two years, I. Uh, I did wear a bulletproof vest, and uh, you know that's the price you want to change the world, man. No good deed goes unpunished. Okay, so, but that was okay. I mean, my wife Rivka supported it, and you know that was the key. But you got if you're going to believe in something, you want to do something, you got to hang in there. You know, very you true. Yeah. Uh, Julio had a question. Yeah, he said, with Russian diamonds coming into the consumer market, is there a way your program? can help differentiate Russian versus non-Russian diamonds? Well, yeah. First of all, there's this whole issue of supply chain auditing. We have now on our RAP, Rappin is the largest trading network in the world, uh, like 1.8 million diamonds. So we've now, just this week even, because of all this stuff, we've added a new field to the database so you can tell you the source. You can now say where the source of your diamond is. And that idea is that you can't necessarily stop all the evil in the world, but you can create good. So people are making commitments and they're saying, yes, I'm telling you, my diamond came from De Beers. My diamond came from Gem Diamonds. My diamonds came from Lesotho. They can actually tell you where the diamond came from. And they are tracking it. They have invoices for the rough. You have the blockchain now. With the blockchain, you're able to do all kinds of things. You've got even GIA has some technology where if you scan a rough diamond before you cut it, Anywhere in the world that that polished diamond gets submitted to the GIA, they'll be able to tell you this polish came from that rough. So like I said, we're on the slippery slope of legitimacy. You can't, well, with the GIA, you can actually look at the chemical breakdown of the diamond, but mostly it would be supply chain ordering, similar to what you see in the textile industry. And don't forget about recycle. Recycle, huge market. Lots of estate jewelry out there, Okay. United States demographics, a lot of people. I think we got something like 23.7 million people over the age of 70 in the United States. Diamonds are forever. <laughs> Little oldies are not. So what's going to happen out here is that there are a lot of goods that come through that are being audited. Okay. okay. Aaron wanted to know, how effective are the global mining and extraction agencies at pol- policing its actual the actual work done by extraction companies at the on-site location? I think that this is a work in progress. 
a lot of the big companies like the Bears, and I'll tell you, me even Al Rosa, Al Rosa was taking major steps to become more socially responsible. Um, but in any case, a lot of the bigger mining companies now all have inspectors and they have, you know, not all of them, you have to look at it. I think Tiffany is supporting one group, Irma, I think it is, that has standards for the diamonds and there are standards now uh, for mining. There are a very good mining standards out there. And again, set the standards, do the auditing and kick people out of the organization. You know, that's why I think the RJC is now going to be pressed with ISEAL because they're going to have to now uh, enforce their, their standards and stuff. But yes, mining is definitely a place. Now, look, you got to understand what you know. Mining, when you're digging a hole in the ground, which digging fences around it, it's easy. When you're dealing with artisanal diamonds, alluvial diamonds, diamonds that are scattered by ancient volcanoes, that's a whole other story because those diamonds are found all over the place. So they're much harder to, um, to, to, to check the supply. But I do think to De Beers' credit, it's not a profitable business, but they're running this gem fair thing in Sierra Leone where they are working with artisanal miners. They have iPads. They have locations that they can see where exactly the diamond was found. And so they're able to provide source identification. But it's a process. I think it's perfect. It's a constantly improving process. Uh, Michael Mullins wants to know, a lot of your passion and emotional control while telling this very difficult story seems like the human desire behind blood dying is exactly the same that is causing the war in Ukraine, as well as many other gigantic global issues, the relentless pursuit of power. Can you give examples in any industry or with any product that this has been properly dealt with? Again, it's a process. I think that the laws about the Congo in terms of dealing with coltan uh, has not properly, but they have diminished it. So if you're looking for 100% anywhere, you're not going to find it. But what you're going to see is consistent improvement. I was talking to the head of Signet, which is the largest jeweler. He was saying to me, well, you know, 36% of our supply now are exactly, we know exactly where they come from. And we're working with people who don't know where the supplies come from to implement better supply chain controls. So I think that another industry, fish, although there's been some scandals, but fish, um, timber, okay? You've got the council that works on timber. You do have fair trade associations that are doing interesting things uh, with everything from gold to soccer balls to chocolates, okay? So what you see is you see an environment that's evolved over the years, but now there's wind in our back. Now there is greater consumer interest and that's where it starts to pay to do things i many years ago as i was talking to the head of uh, i guess social responsibility at uh, starbucks and they were buying uh, fair trade coffee um, but they said only about 20 to 30 percent because they applied the same standards everywhere but the ngos wanted so much money they felt that they could just grab in so there's a lot of different players with a lot of different agendas okay and there's some pretty greedy people in the NGO community as well. <laughs> and so, you know, things tend to work out. Uh, things tend to work. But, I, you know, my rabbi used to say, Rabbi Riskin, he said, listen, he says, I don't know how religious people are. I don't know how religious you are. But tell me something. Are you getting more religious or less religious? <laughs> so the question is, are we moving in the right direction? And I think that we are. And I think we will even move now much faster. Uh, and maybe it's even just because of the weather. People are so much more aware of social responsibility when it comes to environmental issues that they're applying it to other issues as well. Okay. Final question, Sean. Beyond tracing diamond origin, are there any efforts to add value closer to the source of diamonds, especially for mining communities, capacity development, cutting, polishing, etc.? Oh, definitely. I mean, what you're seeing here is, first of all, you have groups that are putting together cooperatives in places like Peru, Colombia, Africa also, um, where we're actually working, not me, but other people. And that's the beautiful part of this. This isn't like a one-man band. There are a lot of different people that are engaged in this, and they're creating together micro-communities where people come together. A lot of women, they're empowering women in some of the poorest places in the world, and they're making sure that they're getting an opportunity to work or to get a fair share of the revenue. Um, and so there's social change, too. There's uh, different values being expressed as women become more powerful in communities um, and also the earning power increases. So I would say that a lot of this is grassroots all the way. 
Uh, and then, you know, there's all the questions of the bigger companies. There's issues about what are we going to do about the smaller people? It's so much easier to do supply chain um, auditing for big companies that have these big mines and you know they, they, they document everything than small diggers that are out there. But there's a, a lot of effort going into working with uh, small <coughs> And frankly, in my view, a fair trade diamond <coughs> or fair trade gems or fair trade jewelry are really tremendous. It's great. And then, you know, recycled is good too, but I think the, the, the nicest thing in the world is when you get fair trade products that the product itself uh, beneficiates, helps <clears throat> uh, people who are, you know, the very edge of economic you know, capabilities. Now, you have to be careful because sometimes it's dangerous because you're giving money to people who should be in agriculture and now you're just overly supporting all kinds of uh, inefficient things. But I'd also like to point out the anti-mercury campaign for gold. A lot of the gold panners uh, use mercury, which is terrible, terrible stuff. It's, it poisons children. It's just bad. And so now there's a major effort to pay people more. And so these are panners. These are artisanal guys. And for not using mercury. And so they use alternative ways to do that. So, and there's even contests that are put out there. So I, I think that not only are we in the slippery slope of legitimacy, we are on the desire and the direction of social responsibility, responsibility. People want good. They want to do good things. They want to help people. They want to buy products that make the world a better place. And I think that, and just, I want to close with one point over here. You know, God gave diamonds to the poorest people in the world. And when I say poor, I mean, what am I going to feed my kids tonight? And God made the richest people in the world desire those diamonds. So our job, the diamond industry at least, or my job, is to bridge that gap, to move the diamonds from the poorest people to the richest people and move the money and the resources from the richest people to the poorest people. And in my view, that is really... Tikkun Olam, that is fixing the world. Thank you. Thank you. So what can the audience do to help you that are wa listening live and uh, going to watch the replay? Send me an email. Uh, <laughs> let me know who you are. And we'll find great ways for you to help and do things. And, you know, we want more influence. We're not looking for money. We're not, you know, but we're looking to the, get our people put together. We want to get more people to influence the diamond and the gem industry as well. And we're really looking to work together with others. So send me an email. Just send me an email. Say, I saw this thing. I thought it was really great. And, you know, and then we'll put together, we'll send you some information. Read the Blood Diamond articles that are sitting on RS, uh, uh, SR, social responsibility.rapport.com. Read it. You'll hear about what the trade. You'll learn a tremendous amount about this whole idea of what's happening with Blood Diamonds. And maybe you'll think about how that can go elsewhere. But just send me an email and go to R, uh, to social SR at rabbitport.com and drop me a note. I'm real. I'm here. Hello. <laughs> I know you're very real. I'm just going to take a group selfie for with everyone just to prove that they were actually here, to, that they can uh, show to their boss or their, their partner that they were in li lying around in a, in a bar. So, um, Martin, thank you so much, for one, for taking the time, and two, for basically um, doing the work that you're, that you're doing. It's absolutely... Uh, spectacular. I mean, it, it, it just, and also, you know, rolling the stone up the hill all these years uh, to, you know, to um, to achieve what you've done. I mean, it's so tenacious. It's just in, incredible. So I want to thank you. Well, I will be sending out a um, a uh, a uh, a link where people can watch the replay. Uh, at any time. I want to thank our entire production crew, Sam, our producer, Crypto Genius and Ramen Critic, Ricky, my absolute better half with no filter, Xi Jinping, our head of transparency and integrity, Vladimir Putin, the director of the Ukrainian cultural heritage, Elon Musk, our humility coach, and Sergei Lavrov, our fact checker extraordinaire. Thank you so much. And thank you all. We'll be doing a short uh, virtual mixer after this. So please stick around if you can. But Martin, I understand you have to jump on the call right away. Uh, I think Beyonce is asking for her jewelry right away. So thank you so much. Stay well. Thank and we go right Bob. into the mixer.
uh, right uh, here.